we were going to mention Councillor Malik that he's yep. now stepped down, but um, I haven't had apologies um, from anybody else. And we have Mr. Luke here today instead of Mrs. Lawrence. So thank you. Okay. Um, thanks very much, Steph. And um, good morning and welcome to members uh, the pension committee and board meeting. And uh, as you know, this is the remote meeting and I would like to pass on to Steph for the housekeeping. Thank you, convener. So as you mentioned, we're fully remote today. So please, everybody note that the public section of the meeting will be recorded and published online for the public to, public to access after the meeting. Um, can I ask that all attendees switch off their camera and mute their microphones when not speaking, um, but that you switch on both camera and microphone when you're invited to speak so that this is picked up on the recording. If members do wish to speak, could I ask that you please either use the raise hand function or indicate in the chat. And if you're having any issues with either of these, please just activate your camera and signal that you wish to speak. Um, if anyone does lose connection during the meeting, if possible, it would be helpful if you could indicate to me by private chat or email, and we can hopefully take a short adjournment to try to reconnect you. So I'll now just take a short roll call and would ask that members confirm their attendance when I call your name so that this is clear in the recording of the meeting and can also be recorded for the meeting. Convener? Uh, present. Vice convener? Councillor Allard. Councillor Allard, I think you're on the call. <laughs> OK, um, I'll come back to Councillor Allard if that's OK. Uh, Councillor Bell. Uh, yes, good morning, present. Good morning, Lord Provost. Present. Councillor Delaney. Present. Councillor Henriksen. Present. Councillor McGregor. Okay. Councillor Wheeler. Councillor Wheeler, again, I think you are on the call. I just can't hear you, sorry. Hi, good morning. Morning, thank you. Um, Councillor Allen. Here. Councillor Cowan. Present. Councillor McKelvey. Present. Mr. Hodgson. Present. Mr. Luke. Present. Mr. Sterling. Present. And Mr. Walker. Present. Thank you. I'll just check. Councillor Allard, are you able to hear me now? I, I can see him on the call convener. I'm just not hearing him. I'm afraid. Councillor Allard's um, substituting oh, today for Councillor Cook. Okay. Sorry, I should have said that at the start. Oh, hopefully, Councillor um, Allard will join us soon. Thanks very much, Steph. Um, Thank you. Remember, just let you know that Liam Knox has uh, now left his uh, trade union role as a um, full-time convener, so um, will no longer be a board member, and we are waiting to be advised um, of his replacement. Okay, moving on to agenda item 1.1, um, notification of urgent business none. And 2.1 uh, and determination of exempt business. Can we agree that uh, agenda item 11.1 and 11.2 be considered in private? Agreed. Excellent. Thanks very much. And declaration of interest. Any anybody would like to declare interest? No. Thanks very much. Uh, moving on to agenda item 4.1 minute of previous meetings uh, uh, on page 7 to 14. All correct. Thank you very much. Um, agenda item 5.1 uh, business planner. Um, there is nothing change uh, uh, unless if you like to ask any question, but seem to be everything fine. No. no. Moving on 6.1 um, notes of motion none. And the main agenda item 7.1 is budget. And I would like to invite Laura. Thank you, Kavina. Um, this is our, the annual uh, budget uh, report um, forecast for 2021 uh, 22. I'm happy to take any questions. Members, any questions? No, cannot see any any hand at all. 
So, seem to be everybody happy then, yeah? Agreed. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Moving on to next item, agenda item is. Sorry, I just have a, some issue with my technology. External audit. Can I invite Gillian, please? Yes, good morning uh, from Edinburgh to members of the Pensions Committee and the Pension Board. So this is a, an important report that I'm presenting to you at the conclusion of the audit of the 2020-21 accounts. So the first paper you have in front of you is our cover paper. Uh, this is on page 25 of your papers and it's addressed to the Pensions Committee and Pension Board dated the 9th of September. So that's the day we got the papers out. Uh, just to let you know, this is us coming to the concluding stages of the audit. Uh, I, in my covering letter, I let you know that we've uh, undertaken our audit in compliance with international standards of auditing. And in paragraph five, uh, I'm obliged to let you know about any misstatements that remain unadjusted. And I'm pleased to report there are no unadjusted misstatements uh, to report to you today. An important paragraph on page 25 is paragraph six entitled Fraud Subsequent Events in Compliance with Laws and Regulations. Now, throughout uh, our interaction as uh, the audit team with your officers and also attending these meetings, we feel that we are kept right up to date with any instances such as these. But if there's any members of the Pensions Committee or Pension Board um, feel that there's anything that they're aware of that has not been drawn to our attention, this would be their opportunity to let us know that. In paragraph seven, a reminder that we do seek a letter of representation um, from Mr. Belford as your section 95, 95 officer. Uh, I'd like to bring you right up to date with paragraph nine. So these were outstanding matters at the date that we issued these papers uh, for the purposes of today's meeting. I'm pleased to report to two members that the due diligence, uh, we were seeking uh, assurance that due diligence had been duly carried out on Rothsey Life PLC, and I'm pleased to report that we have obtained that audit evidence. We were also uh, concluding work on cut-off sample testing. I'm pleased to report that that work is now complete with no findings that I need to draw to your attention. With respect to the final two items, normally by this stage of the pension fund audit, we would be in receipt of the uh, annual accounts duly signed by the external auditor of Aberdeen City Council and also in possession of the final annual audit report on the audit of Aberdeen City Council. Uh, both of these are important to us because there's a key system on which the pension fund is dependent uh, from the council, which is to do with payroll. And as of just now, I'm not in receipt of either of those documents. Um, I don't know if, uh, Convener, if you'd like to get an update from the Section 95 officer at this point, or I could continue with the main report at this point. Just carry on, uh, Gillian, carry on the main report, please. Sure, will do, thank you. So we'll come back to that. So the proposed opinion is in Appendix A, and I'm pleased to report to members that we are proposing an unmodified opinion, which is exactly what you would wish to receive. And in my opinion, the financial statements as presented give a true and fair view of the financial position at the end of the year and also of the transactions that have taken place during the year. So that's the big important message for today. Uh, the independent auditor's report then goes on to elaborate further about the basis of all the work uh, that the audit team have undertaken. And I'm, I'm pleased to see that I'm accompanied um, by my colleague Rachel Brown at today's meeting. We then go on further about uh, cross-referring you to any our records of risk of material misstatement, and that's as we've identified through the planning process. We also talk about the respective responsibilities of uh, accountable officer and myself as the auditor. And then later on, I'm looking now at page 29 of your papers. I'm also required to give an opinion on the management commentary and the annual government statement, and also the government's compliance statement as they sit in the pension fund annual reporting accounts. And I'm pleased to see I provide positive assurances for all of those areas. 
And finally, I have no matters that I'm required to report to you by exception. So this is a good outcome uh, for the pension fund uh, at the end of our audit of the financial statements. Appendix B relates to the letter of representation. Uh, we, this is normal for us to seek this from management at the end. I think you'll be quite familiar with the content. It's a very, very much a template uh, that we use with all of our audits, but we do tailor it as appropriate to circumstances. And in your case, I'm looking at page 32 of your paper and the section on assets. And there's further elaboration there to do with your investments, your property assets and your long term assets. And this has all been tailored specifically um, for the North East Scotland Pension Fund, including the Transport Fund. So we look forward to receiving that signed um, from the Chief Officer of Finance at the point at which the accounts are approved. So I've reached the foot of page 34, so I'm happy to pause there before going on to the annual audit report. Um, before I give opportunity to remember, Jonathan, sorry, I did not see your hand. Would you like to ask any question? Convener, thank, thank you. Um, uh, thank you. It was just in relation to the point that Gillian was making about the city council accounts. Um, it was just to confirm those are, are signed this week um, in terms of the, the final documentation, which was delayed due to um, some illness and some absence, which um, unfortunately couldn't be avoided. So um, that uh, will hopefully wing its way um, to Gillian and the team um, in, in due course and including the um, annual uh, audit report from uh, KPMG um, and that'll provide the final assurance. What I can provide assurance to the committee is that that is an unmodified um, audit opinion also um, in terms of Aberdeen City Council's uh, accounts that was reported on to um, audit committee um, a couple of months ago. Just want to update convener. Thank you. Thanks very much uh, um, Jonathan and members uh, would you like to ask any questions or any comments? No, sorry. Gillian, carry on then. Oh, there is there is question from member um, number twenty. I don't know who is number twenty. I can only see on my screen. Councillor Allard, I think. Councillor Allard, go ahead, please. Thank you very much, Corinna. And my apologies, I couldn't get any sound working uh, with Teams, so I'm I'm on now. Uh, thank you very much for this. Uh, Ms. Willem, I just wanted, first of all, to check if we are on page 34. Uh, I've got uh, a question on page 34, then I've got a group of questions on further pages afterwards. Would you like me to ask the first one and the others later, or would you like me to get all of them now? No, I, I'm fine. If the convener is fine to take them from the cover paper, uh, as, as and as you mentioned, that ends on page 34. To ha so happy to take that question first. Yeah, go ahead, Jonathan. Sorry, yeah, on sorry, page, sorry. Sorry. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you very much. On page 34 is just a, a little point uh, of uh, of clarification more uh, than than anything else. Uh, is regarding the use of commas on the two last sentences in 26 and 27. Uh, it makes it a bit challenging for me to fully understand what requires to be reflected. Uh, is nothing is reflected to be reflected or the fact there have been no changes requires to be reflected. The two, the two sentences have got different set of commas and I, I got a little bit confused, so it would be great if you could clarify the two yes. sentences for me. I must say those paragraphs were intended to provide you with positive assurance. So we will read that carefully and check with uh, Jonathan before he signs them that he is comfortable that that is clear. So thanks for pointing out that that could be read a different way. Thanks very much, Mr. Allard. Thank you. Gillian, you can carry on, then Councillor Allard can bring the rest of his questions. Thank you, Convener. So turning to the annual audit report presented before you, starting on page 35 of your pages, um, and if you, this is our final draft, we don't expect it to change, but we take the word draft off once the accounts are duly signed, including 
uh, me signing the independent auditor's report. So on page uh, 37 of your papers, we capture the key messages there. And I think you'll find a lot of positive assurance there, therein. And these are key messages that I think are worthy of being communicated more widely beyond the Pensions Committee and the Pensions Board to provide assurances to other officers and to other stakeholders. But for the purposes of today's meeting, Convener, I shall be taking members uh, through the body of the report. So I'm turning to the section which is entitled Introduction on page 39. So uh, sets the scene very much for all of the audit work that we undertake and also makes the link to the annual audit plan that has been uh, in front of this committee at an earlier date in the year. So I'm turning to section one, which is on page 42 of your papers. And this is very much a focus on our audit of your annual accounts. So I'm reiterating there our opinions, which are unmodified on the financial statements, and that all of the narrative was also in compliance with requirements and consistent with our understanding of your financial performance. I'd like to draw out paragraph 16. The unaudited annual report and accounts were received in line with the audit timetable. The working papers were of good standard. Finance staff provided excellent support. I have to say it's quite a rarity, for us as external auditors to use language like that, uh, but that was very much our experience. And um, just for uh, members to be aware, it's been a very challenging year once again during 2021 for finance officers to maintain their accounts and to produce the accounts at year end. And also mm -hmm. uh, we have a number of challenges in Audit Scotland. So this is a really good position we've reached and we recognise the commitment that your finance officers have made for us to reach today's date. Further on, a, a reminder that uh, members of the public can raise objections on local government accounts, but no objections have been received on the unaudited accounts. On the next page, page 43, a reminder of the levels of materiality that we work to in the conduct of our audit work. And also in exhibit one, a reminder that the transport fund is becoming a much more significant element of our audit than has been the case in previous years. Uh, a reference in paragraph 21 to appendix two, that's a very important follow through uh, relating to the risks we identified at the planning stage, all the work we've done and our conclusions thereon. So on the next page in exhibit two, there's just one significant finding we're wanting to draw to the attention of members and this is uh, consistent with prior years. It just so happens that within your portfolio you have a significant number of private equity level three valuations and at the time that the draft accounts are prepared uh, you're not in possession uh, for the accurate valuations as at financial year end. However during the currency of the audit that information is forthcoming and in the column saying resolution uh, you can see that the, the accounts have been amended to take account of an increase in value of 66 million by year end uh, in regard to this category of investments. So I'm turning to the next substantial section, which is financial management, starting on page 45. Uh, this is an area that I'm sure the committee and board have been following throughout the year, and this is the recovery in the investment performance during the year subsequent to the dip in March 2020. So I think we capture it at quite a high level in paragraph 25, a reminder that during 1920, investment values reached the height of 4.8 billion, but by year end with the pandemic and significant uncertainty at a global level, they had dipped to 4.4 billion. Uh, I know you will have been monitoring on a quarterly basis and the assets have rallied very significantly now being recorded at 5.777 million uh, by the end of this year. Um, there's a little bit more narrative there about the contributions in and the benefits being paid out and not dissimilar to a number of local government pension funds across Scotland. You now are at a maturing phase where the cash flow is in a negative situation. Um, and we can see later on uh, the balance of the membership and why that's the case. And we know that you are active in your investment strategy to take account of this maturing picture. 
Exhibit 3 on page 46 provides a high level summary of some of the key figures echoing what's represented uh, in the annual accounts. And I know that the unaudited ones have previously uh, been presented to you, so you'll be familiar with, with these figures. In paragraph 31, important to talk about the transport fund. So we had membership transfer in uh, last year, but the insurance buy-in this year. So very, a very significant uh, action that was undertaken during the year in which we've had to invest time in auditing and also with referral to our colleagues uh, in professional support internally in Audit Scotland to be satisfied as to how that's all represented in the annual accounts uh, at year end. And we are indeed satisfied with how they're presented at year end. At the foot of page 47, uh, we're talking about the financial arrangements that you have in place and in our opinion, they are appropriate and effective. On page, uh, on the, page 48, uh, references there with respect to the systems of internal control and largely operating effectively, but there are two areas we've highlighted for improvement with respect to reconciliations and respecting authorisation limits, and these manifest themselves in recommendations uh, later on. So turning to page 49, and in the middle of that page, each year, we also look at the arrangements you have in place for the prevention and detection of fraud and error, and also for standards of conduct. So once again, we provide positive assurance, including in paragraph 46, assurances about the arrangements you manage to maintain uh, during COVID-19 and working remotely. Our third substantial section relates to financial sustainability, and that, after all, is at the heart of the Local Government Pension Fund. We're picking up on the reporting of the triennial valuation that took place. Again, that has provided you with much assurance about the level of funding for both the main fund and the transport fund in that regard. And turning to the next page, page 51, we're also looking at financial planning arrangements and in our view, they're appropriate and effective. And we provide more detail there about the investment strategy review that you had undertaken and also uh, the decisions that you took, given the very different risk profile for the transport fund and the fact that it's a closed fund in that regard. And you were definitely trying to de-risk in the decisions that you made in that regard. Page 52 has a, has a helpful exhibit five. I hope, I hope members can see it on colour in their screen. And whilst the active members remain fairly constant as you glance, glance over the five years, you can see the creeping up of the balance that meant there are members who are pensioners as well as the deferred members. And this is why you're getting this change in balance in terms of the cash flow and benefits out are greater the contributions in uh, at this stage. Uh, we also exhibit six is quite a stark uh, illustration of what happened when the two funds merged back in 1920 with Strathclyde uh, and the implications that therefore is having going forward for how you manage that fund and have, as I mentioned, de-risked it uh, during this year. On page 54, uh, paragraph 64, a reference there to um, employer contributions. The triennial valuation is very important for giving you your assurances about the adequacy of employer contributions and for all of your members, consistency is really important for them to manage all of their financial planning over the medium and longer term financial plans. So Exhibit 7 gives you an idea of the spread of the pension fund. Yourselves as Aberdeen City Council, uh, the other scheduled bodies will be the other two councils uh, and then all of the other members uh, that are involved. Section four refers to governance and transparency, and we've provided quite a bit of narrative here about how arrangements have been sustained at a time of remote working. And these are the sorts of areas that the Accounts Commission is very interested to hear about as they have their overview across the 11 pension funds uh, across Scotland. Um, we've also made reference there about the numbers of uh, experts that you place reliance on to support you in all of your work. Uh, and so, for instance, some reference there to um, Savills in paragraph 67 and arrangements there. We have in our next section, which, which starts at the bottom of page 55 and continues, um, we're talking about your, the extent to which you comply with the requirements of the Pensions Regulator Public Service Code. 
which is a very significant code. And through our review of the records, we could see that not all members were managing to achieve the minimum expected level uh, for training. So we do have a recommendation uh, in connection with that. Picking up on performance reporting, we felt it was of a good standard and we've also given positive assurance about how you're adhering to the public sector requirements of openness and transparency uh, on page 57. And we have finished off on paragraph 78 in drawing out the increasing emphasis that you're placing on environmental, social and governance matters in your consideration uh, of investment decisions. Our final substantial section uh, relates to best value. So we're very much looking here at all of the back office that sustains the pension fund. And there have been a huge number of challenges, not just uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, but members will be aware of all of the challenges with auto enrolment, etc. in recent years, um, the employer cap, the McLeod judgment, etc. Your officers are having to stay right up to date all of the time in an increasingly complex environment. Uh, so we have highlighted there though that performance was maintained in the priority areas, although it couldn't be sustained at, at that level uh, everywhere. We also summarise on page 59 the fund investment performance and illustrate that further in exhibit 8 on uh, page 60, at the top of page 60. Um, and we're also looking at the degree to which you're trying to ensure you secure best value when you're scrutinising investment management expenses. Um, and Clean Wiener, that brings me really to Appendix 1, which is a key document uh, for the committee and board. These are the recommendations that we've made at the end of our audit. Uh, we're, we're assured with the arrangement, the comments that we've received from management and the timing thereon, and these are areas that we will follow through uh, in due course. And as I earlier mentioned, Appendix 2 captures for you all of the risks we identified at the planning stage and how we have followed them through. Appendix 3 is a cross-reference to all of our national performance reports, and I think the local government ones will be of particular interest and perhaps digital progress as well, uh, in light of everything that the pension funds are doing uh, to make access uh, more, more digital and more user friendly. So convener Rachel and I are here ready to respond to questions that committee and board members may have. Excellent, Gillian. Um, Councillor Allard, please. Thank you, convener. I've got quite a lot of questions. I don't know if you prefer to take over. Uh, Gillian, is, Gillian is happy to take all of your questions. Hopefully you got more than two dozen, so just carry on one by one. Very good. Thank you very much, Governor, for your patience. Uh, my first question is uh, uh, on uh, transparency. Uh, you, you, you show some, uh, some concern uh, regarding uh, on the governance and transparency on page 38 which is a point 12 and uh, i just wanted to know how uh, you didn't put so much afterwards in the report on uh, how we could remedy this kind of of problem and transparency and particularly on the attendance at pensions training which is not meeting the expected level. I, I would have questions to officers later on in the day in this meeting about it, but I just wanted to have your point of view of a new experience. Uh, are we really not doing as good as we should do because our our pension fund is doing a fantastic good job on what we're supposed to do. It looks like us members are not pulling our weight and not doing the uh, the require the requirements the requirement that we have on training. So, have you got any advice for us how to deal with it? Any advice to the uh, people in the fund how to make sure that we do what is required? And maybe the, uh, highlighting the difference between members of the board and members of the committee, if you can. Thank you. Thanks very much, well, Councillor Allard. Yes, thank you. Um, sorry, somebody slipped up on my screen at the same moment. Somebody saying, call me. No. So thank you for the question. I can't find it based on your cross references there, but I absolutely get your point about where does our emphasis lie. You've asked for our views. 
So we find that this pen, when we attend this pension fund committee, it is a much briefer meeting than what we are familiar with elsewhere. I think the councillor is right to point out that you get a lot of positive assurance from the papers that you receive from both officers uh, and ourselves. Um, I mean, I think I find it helpful to know that if that is the reason for not asking the questions, uh, there's also not many observations made uh, during the meeting. So I think it's just the volume of um, discussion is much, much lighter here than what we do are familiar with elsewhere. I do audit another two local government pension funds and they also sit with the, the pension board when I present reports. Um, you rightly ask, is there a distinction to be drawn between the committee and the board participation? I think the, the board and the committee have different and distinctive rules, but have a joint interest in the success uh, of, the, of the pension fund. And the committee will have a particular interest in the performance of the fund, and the board will have a particular interest in the administration and the governance of it. So I, I think that's okay. And I don't, I don't mind if they've got similar or different questions in that regard. But I think even if there aren't a lot of questions, a sharing of comments and observations would be helpful to know that our messages are being received. That's what I would say. Thanks very much, Gillian. Next question, Councillor Allard. Thank you very much for that. And I, I will we'll take it up with officers and with ourselves to try to see how we can improve it, particularly regarding training. The second question is uh, on page 38 as well, it's on the governance and transparency again, is regarding our consideration for environment, social and corporate governance, which I thought you were very positive ab about. Uh, and again, with your experience of, of uh, uh, looking at other funds in Scotland, I would love to have you, your views on what you wrote. Is actively considering environment, social and corporate governance matters enough at this point, and particularly a few weeks before COP26, and have been considered this for years? Are we in advance compared to the others, or are we slow down of what we want to achieve. I just want to have your views on that because actively considering it's not as well as doing really what maybe we ought to do. Thank you for the question. Um, I can report from my experience of auditing um, three pension funds currently um, that all three are, well, two out of the three in particular are emphasizing ESG matters in their annual report and accounts. I, we've drawn attention to it here because you are giving it more attention than you have done in previous years. So it's probably more to do with the relative performance for you as an individual pension fund as opposed to comparing it across the way with everyone's reports in 2021. I have been an auditor of local government pension funds for 15 years, I think. And um, I've never seen so much written about ESG as has been the case during this current appointment round. So the, we're into year five of our audit of North East Scotland Pension Fund. Um, we know that uh, local government pension funds in general are very much signed up to the United Nations uh, statements of responsible investment. But we also know that you are always have to strike a balance in your investment decisions you have to get the, the right and the best level of returns for all of your members. So you're always taking an informed decision about what routes that you go down in that regard. Um, I was keen to draw this out in our annual audit reports to do with local government pension funds this year because the accountancy institutes, so the Chartered Institute of Public Finance uh, Accounting and the Institute of Chartered Accountants for England and Wales are doing a huge amount all to do with um, the role of accountants to do with uh, climate change and challenges and so on. And interestingly, it's the local, go local government pension funds that are the most vocal on ESG matters that I come across, across of the whole of the public sector. And uh, so I do want local government pension fund annual reports and accounts to have some profile because they're already there in that regard. Great, thanks very much, Gillian. Next question, Councillor Allard. 
Maybe th thank you very much for, for the answer. And yes, uh, I, I hope we, we, we are doing as best as we can inside our other phones as well. The last question, I think the last question on 8.1, it will be on page 46 and is the point 29, paragraph 29. The fund actively considers the challenges and considers to monitor risk through the corporate risk register. One of the challenges listed above 29 and 28 is the impact of the EU withdrawal is, is my question is, is the fund monitoring the risk of Brexit? Uh, should, be, should it be separated from other challenges? Have, have other funds uh, maybe separating better? You talked about earlier of a complex environment. Maybe should we uh, separate these different risks and make them clear and more understandable if we do that? Or do you think uh, you're quite happy with the way it's been done so far? So I'm happy to respond to that, but I think it's equally a question to officers. Um, I don't see anything distinctly different uh, in what North East Scotland Pension Fund does relative to what we, I see in other pension funds. I'm conscious that later on that you'll be brought right up to date with investment performance and all the time, all of the risks are subject to consideration um, prior to investment decisions being made. So um, I think we're satisfied at seeing the breadth of the risks that are always being considered, uh, but it wouldn't be for me to decide that one had to be uh, distinctly drawn out from the others. Yes. No, we can bring Jonathan. Jonathan, please. Thanks, convener, um, and and thanks, uh, Gillian, for for mentioning. I was thinking I, it needed an officer response as well, um, and I agree with you. I, I think the complexity and I suppose the global nature of of what we are dealing with there are so many aspects that in their own um, in their own um, setting feel very very um, significant. But actually, in a global setting, actually everything is merged together, and I think. Um, I'm I'm keen to continue that we we look at our risks um, across the piece um, to to make sure that when we're talking about risk registers coming um, to the committee themselves, they're seeing that at a strategic level, and we're not getting into the the detail because actually, un decoupling all of these elements and saying that one can be managed in a different way from another, I'm not sure that that's actually um, possible. Convener, I think um, in, in in relation to to what's being described and the, the wide range of risks that um, when you look at the, the pensions risk register, it is extensive um, and there are a lot of aspects to that. Um, but but equally, it's a highly complex and, and, and global situation. So in many respects, when we're talking about that, I think um, dealing with that at a, a global level and at a strategic level for the committee is, is the right thing to be doing. Great, thanks very much, uh, Gillian and Jonathan. Councillor Allard, any more questions? Yeah. For I, I just want to thank Mr. Bert for this very, very important and very good reassurance. And as, as, as to respond to, to Gillian again, I, the report is very, very good, but he did emphasize the problem we have with community members and board members on the understanding. <laughs> so we need more training to understand this complexity and everything uh, which is present in front of us. More clarity that is and better it is for us. But thank you very much for all that, Convener. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Council Allard. Please do not miss any more training. We are having next year very soon then. And uh, Council McKelvey, please. Thank you very much, Convener. Uh, Gillian, thank you very much for your input so far, and uh, I would add um, my uh, thanks, basically, the, what I'm reading here in terms of the audit is very reassuring that our management and our governance is uh, very appropriate to the pension fund. I have a question for you on page 44 on Exhibit 2 regarding significant findings, uh, perhaps more in clarity and understanding. Um, it says on here that the... Um, valuation which was given in December 31st 2020 um, that you brought about a, a change in the accounts because the, uh, the which, of funds which were received in August of this year and I'm assuming that's the, the, the way they were received so when would the actual strike date be that you've asked for that change to be brought in before the 31st of March this year thank you yeah so also happy to pass over to officers at this point but um, 
you are prompt in the preparation of your draft accounts to get them across to us for audit. And at that point, you're not yet in possession of the valuation of these assets as at the 31st of March. They come through at a later date. So we plan the audit and officers prepare the audit on the basis that these are interim figures until you get the, the piece of paper in August and the piece of paper in August is telling you what the values are as at the 31st of March 2021. Great, thanks Thank very much. If I can bring Laura in, please. Yes, thanks, uh, Camilla. Um, just to add to uh, Julie's uh, response, um, private equity is, is, is in, inherently, there's a de delay in reporting. Um, so to deliver the draft accounts um, in time with the committee, in time with, with the, the set period, we have to, we, are, we, we have a delay in that information and those valuations. So we will only have ever have December's valuations at the time of putting the draft accounts together. And then through the audit process, we will then receive the March numbers and then we update those figures, whether that's an increase in value or it can be a decrease in value. Um, but it, it's just the way that those private markets and private equity um, reporting, there's there's the, just an inherent in, in that delay. And there's nothing we can do about that, um, unfortunately. But um, we correct that that those valuations through the audit process. Thank you both. Thanks very much. Um, any more questions comes from Kelvi? No, Kelvi, no? no, that's me. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. Uh, Council Allard, is your legacy hand or you like to ask another question? Council Allard. No, my hand at the top. OK, no more question. Convener, Councillor McGregor has his hand up. OK, sorry, Councillor McGregor, go ahead, please. Thanks very much, Convener. I'm, I'm sorry about my initial confusion in trying to join this meeting. Um, all this week, I seem to have had a system whereby the Teams thing is trying to connect me to the previous meeting that I was on rather than the one I'm invited to. Anyway, my question, two questions really. One, one about the, the timeliness of the uh, reconciliations that uh, the Gillians covered. And, and the other was this, this question of um, limits for transfers. Um, are, are we happy that that was a one-off um, one problem that uh, people now understand. I mean, if, if different aspects of work have different limits, it's quite easy to think the limit is such and such, but um, obvious, obviously it's different for different things. So are, are we happy that, that that training thing has been uh, has been made clear to, well, officers and, and managers within the system? So I think we <laughs> questions for officers to respond to at this stage. Jonathan, please. Uh, Laura, Laura, sorry. Okay, I'll, uh, happy to submit. Yes, yeah. we are. We are happy with that. We have um, put in that um, that training and 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 dealt with those um, um, authorization levels. So yes, um, yeah. And and similarly with the 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 reconciliations. Yes. I mean, we, we need to do that on a regular basis, obviously. Well, that, that, that recon, rec, reconciliation is, is um, around, it's, it's not necessarily a requirement to do it on a, on a monthly basis um, in, just throughout the year, but we, may, we need to make sure that it is done on an annual basis. But um, yes, we're okay. comfortable with that. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor McGregor. No more questions? Convener, the Lord Provost has his hand up. Lord Provost. Please. Uh, thank you, convener. It was just that uh, I didn't want it to be lost in the <clears throat> in the very in interesting series of questions. There, the, the key point that uh, really is quite an exceptional relationship that our officers have uh, with the external auditor, and it's quite an exceptional report. Just to again draw attention, the auditor auditors are very very careful in my experience in the use of language 
And uh, if they're uh, awarding a, a reasonable plaudit to people, it's something to be treasured. And uh, I really thank uh, the auditors for their work, but also it, it's important we put in record our appreciation to our staff for a really, uh, you know, a very, very top class performance. And thank you to all of them. Thank you. Excellent. Lord Provost, always very, very helpful comments. Thanks very much. Members, if no more questions, Jillian, thank you so much for a very comprehensive report and thank you very much for answering all of the questions in detail. Excellent. And we can move on. Uh, agenda item 9.1. And it is a consideration and a signing of audited annual report and accounts. Um, in our previous meeting, uh, I already moved a motion thanking uh, Laura and her team and um, they have done absolutely brilliant job and we have a fund increase from 4.3 billion to 5.2 billion once again thank you very much you have done extremely well and uh, now I would like to invite Jonathan thanks very much convener and um, yes I suppose starting where where you and and Councillor Crockett have have left off. Um, I think um, it is incredibly um, uh, helpful, um, encouraging um, uh, to to hear the the feedback from our our external auditors. Um, it shows that we have had a very strong performance um, during the the course of the year, not just in asset value terms, but I think in terms of the delivery of what the team have done, um, how they've worked, and how they've continued to change and adapt to the um uh, the changing situation um that we've all had to deal with um during the course of 2021 20, and into 21 22 financial years um i think the the report is incredibly positive from from our external auditors and i think uh jillian and her team uh rachel uh, colin um and and everyone else uh, there who who basically came up with a, an original and uh, original timeline um that uh was going to be extended and they have fought um, uh, very hard to make sure that they have rearranged their their resources to be in the right place at the right time to get this audit and allow this committee um, on the 17th September to actually consider um, the their report. So I'm incredibly um, uh, grateful for um, the, the reworking that they did um, and uh, the, the work that they put in um, during the course of, of the year. Um, but it it's it would be inappropriate not to mention um, the lead that Michael Scroggy takes in terms of from the officer base um, that he takes in preparing um, us for the annual accounts and, and annual report um, process. Um, there's a huge amount of work goes into that. So um, thank you, Michael, for um, uh, leading us through that and and um, and getting us to this very very um, pleasant um, and and very. Um, satisfactory um, position. Absolutely delighted um, with that. There was mention in terms of the recommendations um, and obviously questions around the, the points that were being raised by uh, Gillian and her team. And it's fair to say that we, uh, as Laura was just saying, um, are are taking on board the recommendations, have accepted those recommendations, and and we'll we'll look to make sure that those are all um, put in place. So I think that's um, only right, um, and I think they they do work for for the. Um, for the uh, fund. In relation to the, the training, I suppose, um, for, for Gillian's um, uh, sake, as much as anything, because the committee know this, um, we ran a, a session earlier this month um, on the, the based on the draft accounts um, with the committee and the board, um, which was well attended. Um, we had information um, exchange um, and discussion on the, the key aspects of the accounts, which I think was was helpful just in advance of of now seeing them again um, under this particular uh, agenda item. Um, so um, encouraging that that obviously we'll take that and the experience of that into future training sessions and 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 um, bring greater clarity and greater um, uh, a, a greater spotlight if you like, on, on the accounts um, as as we move forward. But um, uh, I was uh, keen, obviously, to have that done before this this meeting and was pleased to, to get that um, over the line, um, so to speak. Um, but I think without saying anything further, um, uh, convener, 
the the accounts um the recommendations in the in this report are for for the sign off of of the accounts um uh, following uh, final final review and um approval and agreement with um Gillian and her team um happy to take any questions great thanks very much Jonathan and members any questions or comments Councillor Delaney has his hand up, Convener, and Councillor Henriksen and Councillor Bell. Okay, Councillor Delaney first. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Convener. Um, looking at page, um, or page 83, uh, a couple of comments. Um, the first thing is, looking at the, the overall attendance, I'm wondering if percentage is the right way to, uh, to convey it. Um, the reason for that being, um, not everyone attends every session, not everyone's available for every session, but we do actually have a minimum uh, requirement of uh, two training days per year, uh, which uh, most of us do try to uh, to attend. And maybe if we sort of showed what uh, the attendance days were, as opposed to the percentage, I would think it might be more meaningful as, uh, as to sort of compliance. Uh, I'd also have to uh, mention that uh, I had actually attended uh, the full two training days and uh, there has been an error made uh, in that respect. Um, I did make it uh, known to, uh, to Laura this morning. Unfortunately, it was uh, it was probably too late to, to, to uh, do anything with regard to uh, printed copies and, and such like. Uh, but uh, just, uh, I mean, these these things happen. But I, I do think the, the overall attendance may be in days rather than percentage. Because, of course, some training courses will sort of overlap content-wise with others and so on. So uh, we might find that we might not necessarily attend everything, but uh, it's helpful to know if we've actually complied or if we haven't complied. OK, thank you very much, convener. Sorry, Councillor uh, Delaney. Yes, your one is showing only 33 percent, only one mm -hmm. uh, you attended, yeah. but it is just a mis mistake can be rectified. Uh, Jonathan, would you like to say uh, something? Can, convener, I, I, I hear what Councillor Delaney is, is saying there. Clearly, he's had a conversation um this this morning and um, we won't be able to change that for for this set of accounts but i'm happy to take on board the, the the feedback there in terms of the way in which we quantify um just in terms of just making sure that we we understand and that everybody understands the the extent of of training that has has been delivered and has been received um and, and we'll take that away thank you thank you very much thanks very much councillor delaney councillor hendrickson uh, thank you, convener. It, it's, it's along similar lines um, on meeting attendance on page 80. Um, I noticed that um, neither myself or Councillor Reynolds attended the meeting, uh, down as the, uh, not attending the meeting on the 11th of the 12th. But if you actually look at the minutes of the subsequent meeting on the 26th of, the, of March, uh, we're both down as ha having attended. Um, so it's marked us down as not being present on the 11th, but in the me uh, the minutes of the meeting for the 26th, we're both down as being attending. I wonder if that could just be addressed. Jonathan? I, again, I'm not sure that I can correct that in the, the document at, at this point. I'll I'll take the, the point away. Um, and uh, I suppose in terms of, of those, those aspects, um, uh, I think a little um, disappointed that we're, I suppose, talking about this today when we've had the draft accounts and those particular features will have been in um, the the report up until now. So um, apologies, we've, we've not taken that on board and that there is an error. If there's an error there, then i um, happy to, to look at what we can do, but um, uh, certainly take on board the, the, the point that we need to get these um, correct um, in future. Um, but we'll I'll check with the team. Uh, as I say, I'm not sure we'll be able to change that um, as um, as as we're ready to ready to sign. Councillor Hendrickson, would you be happy if uh, you accept these errors? Because as uh, um, Jonathan mentioned, that these cannot be rectified just now. Would you be happy to accept if we can approve the accounts? Uh, yes, Camino, I, and, and it is something perhaps I should have picked up earlier, but I've just picked it up now, so uh, I apologise for that. But um, if it's if it's a done deal, then it's a done deal. If it would be possible to change it, okay. myself and con uh, okay. Council 
Reynolds, I'd appreciate it if it is possible. If Thanks not, very much. If I can bring in Steph and maybe she will help us then. Thank you, convener. I was just going to say it wouldn't be in the accounts, but I can certainly reflect that in the minutes from today so that it's at least recorded there if that would be helpful. Yeah, great idea. Yeah, excellent. Thanks very much. That's good. Councillor Bell, please. Uh, thank you, Nina. Um, can I just um, uh, commend uh, all, all officers on the ex quite extraordinary performance that the North East Pension Fund has had o over the past year? You know, considering the the um, the, the conditions that, that you've been working under, it, it really it, you know very very commendable. I have um, uh, one question and and one other observation really. Um, so the question is just with regard. The um, assets transfer from the Strathclyde Number Three Transport Fund, um, and it, uh, I, so I notice that there's been a, a bulk annuity buy-in policy with uh, Rothsay Life underwriting liabilities. So, can I ask, does that does that completely de-risk the uh, the former uh, pensioners in the Strathclyde Number Three Transport Fund? You know, the, the liabilities for that. Laura, happy to. Take that, Jonathan, unless you uh, want to. Happy for you to to to, to crack on, uh, Laura. So, so we merged the two the two funds so that we we take we took in the, the Strathclyde Transport Fund um, previously, and then we we looked to do a buy in for the pension liabilities for for the combined fund, so the two funds. So it's not just the Strathclyde pensioners, but it's also the Aberdeen pensioners. So. What we've done is remove that liability risk out of out of the fund um, and ensure that um, with with uh, Rothsey. Okay, thanks I, I very much, Laura. Yeah. So may, may I ask a supplemental no. question then? Um, so, so that so the so the um, the transport fund is currently worth three hundred and four point six millions. Um, and you've got this a new you know, this bulk annuity fund. So so this is probably a Darth Laddie question. So what so what happens to the to the to, you know, to to those funds that are still there? You've got the annuity, this bulk annuity. So that that's that's for other future liabilities for um, pensioners as they come up to pensionable age, is it? So yes, so we have a so you you have the the uh, insurance policy on on one side that that is. Delivering those um, pensioner liabilities that we've we've removed to to Rothsey. but we still have around a hundred million um, assets that we are managing um, that will deliver the that um, those pensioners that will will become um, later on through the through the fund's life um, basically. So we still have a hundred million of assets that we are actively managing. Um, we have a strategy, particular strategy for that. For that fund and for that employer and uh, and for those um, um, liabilities that will come come due course. Well, that, that's super. Thank you. Which is obviously why the the audit um, it, you know is is just looks so good. And just one one observation. Um, so I I just really want to commend you on the um, the pictorial financial performance summary um, on page ninety one. Now that's just so easy to understand. You know the the depth, breadth, and number of uh, you know of, of pensions with, with, within the funds. That's just brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. It's all, it's all from me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jonathan, would you like to add something? So sorry, convener. Um, it, it was really just um for clarity around around that. So effectively, what Laura was saying was that two thirds of the value of the transport fund is an insurance policy that's covering the liabilities of current pensioners. Um, and therefore, that's the de-risk bit. We've then got 100 million pounds for future pensioners in order to meet their obligations. I think hopefully that's a summary of what I took from what Laura was saying. Yes, thank you. I I, I understood that. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Members, any more questions? Convener, we've got Councillor Allard and Mr Hodgson as well. OK, Councillor Allard first and then Mr Hodgson. Thank you very much, Convener. Uh, I, I was going to come back. Uh, uh, I've got a question already, but I wanted to come back on page 80 as well. 
to show some of my concern about what we heard from two councillors about inaccuracies. And it's not so much inaccuracy of this report, it's what I was talking earlier on, convener, about uh, the uh, report from the auditors, which have pointed out uh, uh, the discrepancy, the, the problem that we're having as members of the board and the committee on attendance and on training. So I wonder if for next year, we could, first of all, check that everything is accurate. Because I see, for example, one member of the board is said to have no training at all this year. And it looked like that if, if for, not for members of the committee, but for members of the board, correct me if I'm wrong, they have to have a training during a particular year. So we are already out of the normal guidance and what's, uh, I think there is even a possibility of removing a, a, a member of the board if the member of the board has not had that training during that year. So I don't know if there are mitigating circumstances, or I don't know if, like Consulate Donnelly and Consulate Henriksen, uh, there is in fact, it's in fact a mistake that uh, it, it's not right. So I, I would love convener to have some inquiries around this and making sure that uh, if all these points are addressed and they come back later to committee just to uh, have a full understanding of what happened. Um, Council Allard, um, we agree that these two tiny mistakes were made and uh, officer already admitted and we agree that it will be minuted. So what kind of inquiry are you looking for? No, I'm looking at, to, as I said, there is one board member who is uh, uh, marked as not having any uh, training uh, this year, and that is against the guidelines, the regulations. So, so I, I want officers to go and check if that is true, and that to be reflected on what should be done about it, and as well checking every attendance uh, of training and of meetings just to make sure that the committee next time we meet yeah we Council Allard, Council Allard, one of the board members for some reason did not attend any of these training away due to the COVID but we make sure that this is not the case in the future Jonathan would you like to add something yes convener only to take it away um, in terms of, I, I hear what uh, Councillor Allen is, is saying in terms of the accuracy about what the implications are. Um, and I think it, it's helpful that um, clearly um, we've, um, we, we take this away and, and, and consider what and how we report to committee, um, because obviously through the strategy report, we're normally um, providing that information and, and feedback on, on how things are progressing during the year. Um, we want to, to catch this um, during the year and, and while we are in uh, in progress rather than looking back on it um, and, and making sure that that's that's um, then is it factually accurate and so on. This has been an exceptional year and I think we, we recognize that, that, that it has been an exceptional year um, and uh, I, I think all I can do is, is to take away the, the comments um, from the committee um, and the board um, in order that we can try and make things better and, and obviously satisfy ourselves that we're meeting um, regulatory requirements and, and ensuring that the, the people around the table, uh, the pension committee and as the board, um, all have the, the right skills um, and the ability to participate um, as, as we want you to. And that's what we'll do. Absolutely, Mr. Bedford, and thank you very much for this. And let me add that it's not only officers, it's us as committee members who have not realised that all this has happened. So there is a collective responsibility vis-à-vis uh, -vis the auditor papers that we have not managed to, to get that right. If the convener will let me, can I ask my question now, the question that I had? Yes, Councillor Allard, go ahead, please. Thank you very much. It's on page 138. Oh, sorry, 108, uh, 36 of the report is point 13, environment, social and government issues again. Uh, is, I read the forum provides a unique opportunity for Britain's local authority pension funds to discuss shareholder engagement and investment issues. Again, we're talking about discussing the issues uh, and, and I, I just think if it would be more appropriate for us to consider them a bit more actively. So it's more, more not only of what we do, because we do great things. And I've got a great example of the green hydrogen 
example which is given there in the papers, which is fantastic, and I would love it to be made, made more public to, to, to prove how much our pension fund is doing a great job about that. But I, I just want to make sure that in the way we write this thing, we put a lot of things on what we are exactly doing as opposed as what we are witnessing others to do <laughs> or what uh, uh, what we are discussing. So I, I just uh, I really put the same point that I made early on is how offices could be put on the report a lot more clarity of what we are doing to achieve this and giving fantastic example like the green energy. If you got all the example of green hydrogen energy, it'll be, it would be fantastic. Green hydrogen uh, shines very, very well into uh, that debate. Uh, so to finish up, Kovina, the word can is used several times in those pages. We can do this. I don't know if we should be content to read as what we can do as opposed to what we do. So it's not only on what we do, it's what we report of what we do in our report and how we present it. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Councillor Arnold. Can be no, uh, yeah. just just in terms of responding to that. I think I think uh, as officers, uh, we're always keen to hear what the the committee members and board members are are interested in. Um, and we've we've listened, and as as uh, Gillian was mentioning earlier, that much more emphasis emphasis on the ESG aspects of of the the fund. I think we've yeah. we've seen over the last couple of years, we've definitely increased the amount of training, the amount of um, awareness raising, the amount of uh, understanding being brought to the the, the committee. Um, but we're always interested in in actually how can we we do things differently. Um, and if we go back to the the session that was was held earlier um, this year, um, we were looking for for guidance as we were looking for the strategy, um, looking to 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 present opportunities um, and so on. And um, we'll we'll always look for for that, um, and we'll always uh, be looking to to test the 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 committee more about actually how where should we go and where where um, can we go. You use the word can um, because we can. Um, I think it's just getting to a decision point for the committee um, to make sure that actually we we are 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 seeing an opportunity to say this is what we're going to set out. Um, I think I think as officers we'll we'll try and navigate that uh, and make sure that we've got as as much information and the best information um, around us um, in order to make recommendations around um, aspects of say investment. Um, but it's um, it's always dependent on. I suppose the opportunity that's out there, um, uh, and also uh, clarity as to what the the direction of the committee um, it wants to take. And I suppose listening back to what you, as the committee, are, are saying to us about um, how we should proceed um, and how much emphasis or how much action you would like us to take. So, um, as we take more reports uh, up to the committee, then um, happy to receive obviously feedback from the committee about actually the. the the direction of travel that that you'd like us to take, uh, and in order that we can um, refine our our own actions and activities around that. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Um, Council Allard, any more question from yourself, or we can move on. Thank you very much, Convena. And I I was putting that issue, and I know I have put it before, Mr. Bedford and Convena, and and you 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 we are going in the right direction. I just wanted to make that point a few weeks before COP26, convener, that will be a great occasion for this committee and this board to show our appreciation to the team to work uh, towards what we want to achieve. Thank you. Thanks very much. Mr. Hutchison, please. Thank you. Um, oh, sorry. Just, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, just picking up on, on that kind of conversation, I think um, I think that this, I, th I see this fund doing a lot more than than others in the industry i think that um i think you know the, the esg credentials are, are very strong here um i think that across the pensions industry i see lots of people sort of struggling with direct actual tangible actions that they can take um uh, one example i have is I, i'm a trustee of a cancer research um pension scheme and, and they exclude tobacco stocks for, for obvious reasons um, and is that kind of process you can go through that that kind of exclusion of, of stocks and, and kind of your voting and things? It, it's sometimes difficult to articulate 
but um, I think as we as the industry moves, I think we just need to keep at the, foot, the front foot of the, the actions that we're taking in terms of ESG. I think sometimes it can feel as though we have lots of conversations and lots of ideas, but then you sort of say, well, you know, what what do you actually do? Do we buy and sell things? Do we exclude? You know, what what is ESG? And you know, it's, it's quite a difficult to kind of articulate some of it. Um, obviously, with the need to get the return. So I think we are doing quite well, but I think we have something we need to keep uh, keep in mind. Hmm. Um, the other one, observation. I mean, if anyone wants to kind of comment, that's fine. Otherwise, just had a comment on the training log. Um, <clears throat> I think on the the, the training log that, that we've discussed. I mean, obviously, I'm I'm kind of show up as one of the people with zero percent attendance, um, and and that's absolutely true in the context of of the the two training sessions that I wasn't able to attend. Um, I wonder whether we're doing ourselves a bit of a disservice. Um, so I, I use myself as an example um, for my uh, actuarial qualifications and for the, the PMI, uh, Independent Trustee Accreditation. I do a lot of CPD, um, probably average about 40 to 50 hours a year in, in a normal year. Um, if, if, if somebody, you know, member of the public were, were reading this or a scheme member was reading this, it would obviously look as though I haven't done anything. So, Obviously, we can't start trying to reflect every piece of you know, every conference anybody goes to, every training session that anybody goes to. Um, but I wonder whether that we're sort of doing ourselves a bit of a disservice by being quite focused in on on these sort of two particular seminars and, and conferences that were offered. <clears throat> Thanks, Ian. Jonathan, would you yeah, like to add something? I think Mr. Hutchins, um, both both comments extremely welcome. Um, just in terms of um, explaining and and, and providing a, 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 a different perspective, but also a, a, an insight into into what he's he's seeing from from his role. Um, and I think on the, the training one, I'm happy to take away that. I mean, I think that's a, a very valid point in terms of actually just the extent to which somebody's ability and knowledge and experience um, is determined not by one or two uh, aspects. Um, and I suppose we just we've we've um we, we don't need to close our eyes to that um it's just getting the right balance as to what what information so we'll, we'll take that away um yeah. and and consider that if that's okay thank, thank you. you thanks very much um uh, council delaney please uh, yes convener uh, just uh, sort of following on from uh, what's been said on the sort of esg um i'm just sort of wondering if uh, officers are up to date with a a recent uh, BBC investigation, uh, which was done into uh, British American tobacco. I don't know if we still hold stocks there, but uh, if we do, it was quite a sort of uh, damning investigation uh, looking at uh, South African and uh, Zimbabwean uh, operations, and they were uh, alleging bribery and corruption, and in line with obviously our ESG policy, um, we would want to be taking, I'm not suggesting any particular course other than we'd want to be taking a close look at that and seeing whether or not if we do hold that stock it would be relevant to consider our position. So I'm just flagging it for officers to uh, look into and perhaps report back because you may not know that this uh, at, at the moment. And thank okay, you. Thanks. thanks very much, Councillor Delaney. If I can bring in Laura. Thanks, Kavina. Um, Yes, those those issues will be, will be addressed um, via via our fund managers. We will we will hold that stock, whether it's directly with our equity managers or whether it's in our passive um, passive portfolio. Um, and you know those those types of issues will will be picked up by those individual fund managers on behalf of their their clients, and that includes us, obviously. And I'm sure the LAPFF will be picking that up as well. So we may not be directly addressing that ourselves, but our, our relationships with our fund managers and with the LAPFF will we'll pick those, we'll pick that issue up and we will um, look to address that. If thank I can uh, thank uh, Laura uh, for all that uh, assurance and just ask if the uh, officers can keep a sort of watching brief on it, because uh, it is quite concerning, but of course it's, it's a report and of course, I'm sure that uh, we need to verify the, the various aspects and such like. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Delaney. I will ask this question in our uh, next um, LAPFF meeting as well. A, a large proust.
Uh, thanks very much, convener, and your last words there are part of what I was going to say. That uh, you, both you and uh, and uh, the officer there mentioned the LAPFF, the Local Authority Pension Fund Forum, and I think really t I'd like to map that back to the comments from the auditor when she mentioned that uh, ourselves and some of the other local authority pension funds. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, that she she audits that we are particularly forward in raising things uh, uh, on boards. I think that the big choice you have is either to withdraw from companies or to be very active to exit or, or have voice. And I think that uh, your eloquent uh, convener in the LAPFF um, that uh, the LAPFF is what has changed a lot of company behaviour and a whole yeah. lot of, of issues. It includes yes. the ones that were mentioned earlier on uh, energy and the pressure on, on companies like Shell and BP. It started with the local authority pension fund and then eventually they get the big uh, funds to, to follow them. And just to say, I know that I've raised it before, but uh, for example, Rio Tinto, we have, it's the LAPFF that has managed to get a tremendous change in behaviour in some of the mining companies, particularly uh, on compensation for people who have been badly affected by very bad things that have been done in the past. And uh, I'm sure that the LAPFF will be very interested to follow up what Councillor Delaney quite rightly mentions about the behaviour of British American tobacco in the past. Thanks. Thanks very much, Lord Pravos. Members, if no more questions, can we agree the recommendation with the very tiny error 2.1 and 2.2? Great. Excellent. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Jonathan. And uh, once again, thank you all for your hard work. Um, next item is agenda item 10.1, which is a strategy. And if I can invite Laura. Thank you, Kamina. Um, this is the, the usual um, strategy report that we bring um, that highlights a number of um, items just to bring to your attention. Um, I'm not proposing to go through it in any detail. I'm very happy to take questions. Okay, thanks very much, Laura. Members, any questions? Um, Councillor Allard again. Well, thank you very much, Convener. Um, I've got one question. I've got a couple of questions. One in 208. Uh, it's just more uh, uh, a clarification than anything else. Uh, on 28 and 3.9.3, the uh, final sentence, uh, the last sentence says the final three documents have been updated to reflect changes to data protection terms following Brexit. I just wanted to know uh, what type of updates are we talking about here and how much extra work uh, it it, uh, it has done. Okay. Um, uh, thanks, Mari. Mari's going to come in on, on that. Hi, yeah. Um, it was just minor changes to reflect um, changes from the data protection regulation becoming the UK data protection regulation. So just minor changes. Also, Allard. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, very helpful. Uh, Convener, unfortunately, I'll go back to previous discussion and it's regarding page 236. And just to ask to have some clarification. Uh, it says on 236 that the pension board will be collectively and individually accountable to the pension committee. And I just wanted some clarification on that, uh, particularly on the point on the following page, which say a uh, substitute must undertake the same training as set out below, which is the training of uh, uh, board members. So board members and board substitute seems to have the same obligation on uh, training they have to do per year. So I just wanted to have a confirmation of if it's not the case after the conversation that we had, and once we check that it's not the case, 
uh, how do we go about it to enforcing that need what need to be enforced and to make sure that we stay within the parameters which are in the regulation regarding i have to say the board and the board substitute um laura please um Yes, I mean to sit on the board or, or, the, or the committee. You, you know, you you are you do require to have a certain amount of training and, and knowledge and understanding. Um, we we prov we provide the opportunity for training for for board members and there's and substitutes, um, many of which uh, have take that up. Um, and but we, I can't we can't physically force. Um, People to to attend the training sessions, but we can address that going forward if if they continue to not um, attend training um, and bring that up to you know to the administering authority to uh, to deal with uh, uh, non attendance. Yeah, th thank you very much, and and thank you for the answer to to, to my email, which we said a bit too late about it. I'm quite concerned about it regarding having the responsibility put on you, which I think it's very difficult for officers to making sure that, and I'm talking about electing members. I know uh, Mr. Oxton talk, talk about it earlier. I'm really talking about elected members. And I know how difficult it is for officers to exercise that kind of pressure. So I wonder, especially because it's a board and because I read that the pension board will be collectively and individually accountable to the pension committee, uh, would it be convenient, maybe adequate for the pension committee to remind the particularly the elected member of the boards that they have to follow the regulation uh, with a danger that if they don't do it in one year, that they maybe have to be replaced. And the problem is in replacement is that it's, it's not been clear to the substitute that they on the board, not as a committee, have to go through that training as well it becomes very complicated because you will end up with not having the right number of, of, yeah, of the votes. Councillor Allard, yes, it is the requirement for a board member and committee member to must have a training. But as as I said, we had we had a very tough last 18 months, but we make sure that our board member and well, of course, committee member already had board member will have a trip, appropriate no, training. Let, let me let me correct if, if I'm right or if I'm wrong, convener. It's only board member and substitute of the board. And I think we need to have some clarification to try to help officers to put pressure on members of the board, on the boards uh, to, to make sure that we follow the regulations. The regulations are different for the committee that we are for the board. And that has to be really drawn out, I think. Can I, can I just make a comment? You're absolutely right. I, you know, the ministering authority does has to have the authority to remove board members if they do not um, put, um, you know, uh, do the appropriate training. Um, and we have exercised that right in the past, and um, we can look to address that going forward um, as well. But um, they do, we do have the the ministerial authority does have the ability to do that and address that. Well, one of the board member was removed purely because of this reason, but uh, we, we make sure that uh, we just follow the um, the training procedure. There's a number of, of, of hands, so I will. Um, I can see Lord Davos first. Uh, thank you, convener. And I would like again to, to reflect back on the comments earlier from Mr. Uh, uh, Hodgson, I think that it'd be important maybe to capture training that people are 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 doing, not uh, just uh, the 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 snapshot uh, issues that are reflected in the report here. I think that uh, the, the 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 circumstances of the past year would have made it maybe impossible for that particular things to happen for some people. But they may, I mean, you know, Mr. Hodge is a shining example that they may have other the training in other spheres that are relevant to our, our uh, accounting system here. And uh, also we'll have to work hard to make sure that training is available, maybe in a wider scale uh, to make sure that people can access training at different uh, times. So I think that that's a challenge for, 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 for officers, 
and we you know maybe need to, some further uh, discussion uh, on that. I think that uh, you know our normal system is we have very high levels of participation, and that's just been interfered with with the 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 uh, the, the difficult circumstances of the COVID era. But uh, we you know we'll we'll look at the future. Thank you. Thanks very much, Lord Proust. And uh, number seventeen. I don't know who is number it's, seventeen. Uh, Mr. Starling, um, convener. Mr. Starling, please. Hi. Um, yeah, no, I would. I just wanted to highlight that we don't actually have a substitute uh, for the GMB union. If I'm unable to attend, there would be no substitute. Fortunately, I've I've largely attended most meetings and and most of the training that's been on offer. Um, I think the danger is we're obviously looking for consistency in board and committee membership. So we don't don't necessarily want it's not necessarily positive to be removing someone from the board or committee uh, who has experience of it um obviously it does get to the point where if someone's just not attending anything then they have to be removed but i, I don't think it's an easy decision to just say that they are there to be removed um and finding an alternative person to attend could be difficult in some circumstances i mean we don't know at this stage who's going to replace Liam, for instance, in terms of representation on the board. So, so I don't think we can be too hasty about uh, removing people. And I think maybe the figures as presented maybe make it look worse than what it actually is. And obviously I would agree with Councillor Crockett uh, about the the COVID pandemic obviously has made attending training for certain people a bit more, a bit more difficult potentially. Thanks very much, um, Mr. Sterling, for your comments. Uh, previously, yes, one member was removed because uh, been approached various time, but due to his uh, lack of his interest and uh, did not attend some meetings and training. Uh, this is the only last option we use. But thanks very much for your comment, members. Any more questions? No. OK, can we agree the recommendation? Agreed. Agreed. Thanks very much. And now we're moving in, into private session. And can I ask you that make sure that you are in private location? If you need more time, you can indicate.